The G7 group has reached a historic deal to make multinational companies pay more taxes. That's according to the finance minister's meeting in London. They agreed to battle tax avoidance by making companies pay more in the countries where they do business. They also agreed in principle to a global minimum corporate tax rate of 15% to avoid countries undercutting each other. Tech giants such as Amazon, Facebook and Google may face some direct impacts from the deal. So how to assess this new measure which could see billions of dollars flow to the governments to pay off debts incurred during the COVID crisis? And will it put pressure on other countries to follow suit, including a meeting of the G20 next month? Let's loop in our panelists. For the latest on the G7 negotiations on corporate tax and more for the summit, in Chapel Hill, Klaus Laris, Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In Washington, D.C., Peter Kuznick, Professor of History from American University. Last but not least in Shanghai, Shen Ding Li, Professor from Fudan University. Welcome to all of you, gentlemen. I want to start by talking about the corporate tax negotiations among the G7 nations, particularly the finance ministry, it seems to be a huge thing, Professor Laris. This is a provisional agreement, of course. One never knows how it plays out. But the Biden administration has only been in office for six months, less than six months. And to strike such a deal, you know, to negotiate such a deal between January and now early June, this is quite an event. And I think that was totally unexpected. But everyone wants to get his uh, act together and really, uh, really also push transatlantic relations and international multilateralism. And I think the Biden administration in particular, Treasury Secretary Yellen made a great effort and they were rewarded for making that effort. I understand, uh, uh, Mr. Laris, that there are quite different uh, of opinions within even the G7 groups. For example, France, its own tax rate already reaching about 31 percent, uh, while others may not be that level. Meanwhile, there's disagreement about uh, what the digital companies are likely to pay. Uh, earlier, the Europeans already put on certain tax on some of the global American tax co uh, digital companies uh, in terms of fairness. Uh, and now, according to the U.S. officials, uh, once this corporate tax is in place, those extra tax for the American firms uh, due to fairness issue will be scrapped off. So there are a lot of nuances, in fact, out of this Absolutely. looking looking apparently peaceful number. At the moment, in some countries, uh, Google and Facebook and similar countries almost pay nothing even, particularly, for example, in Ireland. Uh, today, Google and Facebook uh, came out with statements saying they actually approve of the 15% deal. They like it. Whether that is totally true, one has to wonder, because it would increase their tax rate significantly. Right. They, but they say that would give them certainty in the international tax uh, arena, which is certainly true, but it would of course be a very costly certainty for Google and Facebook. So the last word hasn't been spoken. Disagreements among the European countries. There are also disagreements clearly to come with the international business world, but still at least an initial deal. And there's deal another has been difference, agreed. for example, between Germany and France. Uh, uh, France certainly is for higher corporate tax as they're already tax rates very high, but Germany having a very different opinion. We are not just talking about bigger and smaller countries. They're also huge countries. They have huge differences in terms of their opinions. So there seems to be a lot of things going on behind the doors. Absolutely. If I could just say about Germany, the German finance minister has uh, agreed to the deal and has approved of it. But of course, the German parliament in the end needs to decide, not just the German finance sure. minister, whether all German politicians, the government and parliament in the end will agree on the deal that is still in the open. But initially, I think they got their act together and let's see what will come out of it. You know, countries are trying to look for uh, new sources of income, uh, revenues uh, uh, through taxes will be able to get more satisfied results as a result of this. But on the other hand, it could also discourage uh, investment, particularly investment from multinational companies. Uh, and 
also there are different interests about different industries and sectors and you know things are much more complicated than the surface. Professor Kuznick, whether higher tax, which is the ultimate discussion, uh, really likely to help with the economy or not? Well, we're facing a, <clears throat> this is taking place in the midst of a global pandemic. And the leaders are looking for solutions. And to, in order to vaccinate the rest of the world, we're going to be needing a lot more money and a lot more commitment. Mm. So within that context, raising these funds is going to be very important. We know that corporations have been getting away with murder, not mm -hmm. literally, but financially in recent years. And what we've seen is this race to the bottom. So they're looking for places where they can uh, set up that they don't have to pay taxes. This is a positive step because it shows the global will and consensus that the corporations that have done so well and the wealthy people who have done so well in mm -hmm. recent years are now going to be held accountable. You have to remember we live in a world in which the richest eight people have more wealth than the, than the poorest four billion right. people. But the wealth, wealthy people have been getting wealthier and wealthier and steps are being taken finally to begin to redress this. So that's the context in which I'm looking at this. Professor Guznik, here's the thing. From G7, among themselves, perfectly okay. If you guys want to do it, go ahead. But if they push it to G20 and ask smaller countries and developing countries, emerging economies, which are trying to attract as much foreign investment as possible at this moment, then would that mean that there is already a lack of a balanced uh, level in field. Well, it's going to be interesting to see how the G20 responds to this. Mm. We don't really know what that response is going to be, but I think the goal is to is to introduce a level of global equity and fairness at a time when it's becoming more and more apparent how unfair the system is right now, how rigged it's been in right. favor of the wealthy countries. Mm. We do not know as to the number, you know, once this tax rate is in place, how much revenue will it bring to governments around the world. But to the political reasons, there seems to be a quite a good momentum for President uh, Biden, at least, uh, from the statement of the G7 finance ministers, quote, we commit to reaching an equitable solution on the allocation of taxing rights with market countries awarded taxing rights on at least 20% of profit, exceeding a 10% margin for the largest and the most profitable multinational enterprises. Those are a lot of uh, uh, technological jargons. But having said that, though, Professor Shen, how do you see this is likely to be reacted among other countries who are not the most developed industrial countries like the G7? In my personal view, this is kind of a minimum tax for so, so big and uh, multinational uh, tech giants to tax them at least 15 percent is at least a moder moderate way mm. to reconcile the conflict of interest uh, among all stakeholders. Mm. Uh, I think for poor country, Indian, they may uh, not like it, such a global deal. They think uh, this would undermine their chance uh, to attract uh, foreign investors. But uh, uh, if we don't have this new deal, more and more trade conflict uh, between India, US, between China, US would happen. So we need to take a balance between those who are supporting globalization and uh, between others okay. who are against globalization globalization. I think in my personal humble view, 15% is very modest. So we need to uh, discuss not only for the financial minister of G7, but in the upcoming right. uh, summit of G7, but also uh, to let more countries, 100 countries to discuss. Eventually, this could be adjusted to 14%, 13%, or even uh, 16%. I will see uh, how this would be uh, globally negotiated and accepted. 
Another thing we move on about the environmental issues. Uh, this is discussed among the G7 finance ministers about setting standards for track records in terms of uh, environmental performance among all the global companies. Uh, at this moment, uh, mainly the companies are coming up with their own standards and they declare it uh, voluntarily to the public. Now, things are likely to change, but we do not know how fast. Uh, Professor Kuznick, how crucial is that, the global standard? Given the fact that there is very little consensus among the global partners, is it going to happen? Well, it's going to eventually have to happen if we're going to have a, a <laughs> That word is very left. important, eventually. Uh, but it's not going to happen very quickly. But the other thing we have to remember is that the G7 represents 10% of the world's population. And it's become, a, in some ways, a diminishingly significant body. Back in 2000, the G7 represented 65% of global GDP, mm -hmm. gross domestic product. Now it's down to 40%. So without China and without India, we're really not going to, being part of it, we're really not going to make major headway whether it comes to environmental standards, global warming, or uh, economic and pandemic standards. So uh, the G7 is a limited body at this point, but I think that the one area, in, or one of the areas that Boris Johnson wants to stress, in addition to dealing with the global pandemic, which he's very much committed to, is making this a success in terms of some positive steps on the environment. Mm -hmm. We have seen, as a result of geopolitics, G7 is trying to make its mark, um, exceeding its earlier role after G20 was born. So how do you see this uh, attempt to shift about the decision-making process uh, in our world today. Professor Laris. I don't think it's going to shift to the G7. The G7 is only the first step on a very long process which becomes more and more global. You can yeah. say initially it really a little club and then it turns to the world and becomes global and the ultimate decision, be it on the environment, be it on the tax or many other issues, has to be a global one which incorporates the major uh, countries in the world and of course that uh, incorporates uh, China and India and very many other countries that okay. cannot be limited to the G7. But the G7 is a useful first step to coordinate some united position, which then can be presented to the G20 and to an even larger body. And in that, sense. that sense, I think it makes uh, sense to revive the G7. It's not useless, but it's not the ultimate decision body. To revive the G7, interesting. Professor Shen. Remember, after 2008, the global financial crisis, there's a huge loss of credibility among the developed econ economies. That's why G20 came into being, and that's why G20 become the center of the stage. Now, what has changed? Will G7 still has the credibility to bring out consensus that G20 would like, uh, given the diversity of the G20? Neither G7 nor G20 are the decision-making body. Mm -hmm. uh, more or less, they are talking a place. Uh, in this uh, uh, way, G7 has not ended uh, its role. It uh, still is a talking place. It's less important, but it can still talk there. Now, given the global polarization, uh, politically, U.S. considers China is challenging, China wants to lead. Economically, U.S. considers China is pre uh, presenting more challenges, uh, sometimes through uh, possibly some uh, unfair means. Then U.S. would need to talk to its older friend within the framework of G7, how to handle a newcomer like China. Therefore, U.S. cannot talk to talk this issue with, uh, with China inside the G20. U.S. has to talk to Friend, older friend in G7, and I present uh, uh, a, a new formula which has a consensus within the G7 and present this to G20. Mm. So this is how I look at uh, uh, both G7 and G20. Mm. Uh, Professor Kuznick, will G7 become a tool for the U.S. to rally its allies against China? 
you know, we had that very, very disappointing meeting in Anchorage. Uh, and it just showed that things were not the way they used to be between the U.S. and China. We've got after the G7, we're going to have Biden meeting with Putin. You know, and, and when China looks at the U.S., China looks at the U.S. as a declining power in the world. The U.S. looks at Russia as a declining power in the world. But the world has gotten much more dangerous. We have the, the confrontation, potential confrontation over Taiwan, which could be a military confrontation. That's probably the most dangerous hotspot in the world right now. We've got the potential confrontations over the South China Sea. We just had the near coming to blows over Ukraine between the uh, United States and NATO and, and Russia. Uh, I mean, we're in a very dangerous world right now. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we need forums, whether it's the G7 or any of these others, NATO, that's going to intensify the confrontations and create a more polarized and, and dangerous world. I think we need to be trying to see what we can work on, what we have common interests on, the pandemic, okay. the global economy, you know, clim climate change, uh, and arms control. We've got a lot of common interests we can be working together on right now. And the G7 could be a positive step in that direction, uh, especially because Boris Johnson wants to make a declaration. We're going to end the global pandemic and the advanced economies are going to play a leading role. Uh, but it could also be a more negative kind of uh, body. So uh, as the summits can be positive or negative. OK, Professor Laris, your final words. I think, you know, one shouldn't be too overly pessimistic. Yeah. There is still a lot of room for compromise. There's a lot of room for joint coordination and for cooperation on important issues uh, in the world, including, of course, between the United States and China, the two most important partners in the world. Okay. So I would say let's use the G20 to cooperate rather than trying to, uh, you know, be too pessimistic. Klaus Laris, Peter Kuznick. Shen Ding Li, thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you.